Hello, I'm Lisa Combs, and today we're going to be talking about uh, the topic of executive function for elementary school children. And we're going to be doing it through a framework called Traffic Jam, which is a, a kind of a little curriculum, mini curriculum that I developed for introducing the concept of executive function to even very young children. Because what we're seeing is that in the last few years, as kids have started becoming, oftentimes coming to school with fewer uh, emotional, social emotional self-management skills than maybe they used to, we're seeing that it's having a really a big impact on their success in the classroom, both academically and from a behavioral standpoint. And so I've gotten lots of requests from folks for suggestions on how to approach the topic or approach the challenge, I guess, of developing those skills in very young children. And so over the years of working with kids who have disabilities that can impact executive function, I've always found that it's really helpful to use what's called a self-monitoring approach to helping kids develop the skills that comprise executive function. Just like when you or I are trying to change something about our cognitive process, whether it is choosing better foods or whether it's saving money or spending less money. Uh, we are having to self-monitor, kind of recognize our own thoughts and feelings and then make different choices. And that requires us to be really kind of aware of our own internal state and our own thought process. And that requires um, some real mindful, intentional, dedicated time and energy to that. So whether it's, you know, you're trying to increase your exercise and so you, um, you know, wear your Apple watch everywhere so that it will count your activity, your steps in your activity level and give you feedback on that. Or whether you are, you know, trying to improve your credit score for your, uh, uh, mortgage application and you download a, a budgeting app. Those are all examples of how adults use self-monitoring of attention to impact their own cognitive process. And so we're going to do the same thing with little ones, but obviously we're not going to use the same kinds of strategies. So we're going to use a framework that kids are very familiar with, which is traffic signs. Everybody sees them in the car with mom and dad, uh, in the bus on the way to school. And so we're going to use a framework that they're already somewhat familiar with in terms of what those signs mean. Those signs are meant to help regulate traffic and give people kinds of alerts to certain situations. And so we're going to explain to them, to the children, that we can use those signs to kind of remind us of strategies that we should do to manage our mental traffic, that we all have thoughts coming and going in various directions, and that it can sometimes cause a traffic jam in our mind where it keeps us from getting things done, or it makes us frustrated, or um, it distracts us from what we're supposed to be doing. And so we're going to use some traffic signs that they may or may not be familiar with to kind of help them manage their mental traffic. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and dive in. And I will say you can use these strategies and even this terminology, even if you don't purchase the book or the curriculum, certainly you can still use the analogy. Um, but the, the book is available on Amazon and it is also, so it's available as a picture book to read to kids. And then also all of the visual supports and the teaching guide is available on Teachers Pay Teachers as well on Best Friend Books, uh, Teachers Pay Teachers store. So getting that little uh, promotion out of the way. I also want to remind you though, that even if you don't use this curriculum, hopefully this presentation will help you think about some of the skills comprised in executive function and how you might approach it uh, with bringing it to the attention and intention of your little ones in school. So with that, I'll go ahead and share my screen and we'll get rolling. So I am going to be kind of working off of my guide uh, tr called Traffic Jam, a guide to ma managing mental traffic. But again, you can easily take the same concepts that I'm going to talk about and use that same framework mentally for yourself or for your kids to kind of help them uh, understand how they can use their own thinking to help them be more successful at school, whether it's 
in getting their work done, whether it's in um, getting along better on the playground, lots of different applications. So um, the three areas that kind of comprise executive function are working memory, which is the ability to keep lots of things in mind and use them at the same time and interchangeably. So it's kind of like a filing cabinet that you're um, pulling out a drawer here and grabbing a file and using it for a few moments. And maybe you keep that out on your desk mentally while you go do something else. And then you know where to put that back in your mental filing ca cabinet. And you know how to interchange which files you're pulling out and using. And you may have two or three sitting uh, to the side while you're doing another one and that you can do that very easily. So that's working memory, keeping lots of information available to you to use as you need and put aside when you need. The second aspect of executive functioning that we're really going to focus on is mental flexibility, which is the ability to see things from different perspectives, change your mind when you get new information, adapt to changing situations, that's called cognitive flexibility. And the last section and one that oftentimes maybe we're more aware of is impulse control. It's the ability to self-manage, uh, knowing and thinking ahead before we say something, before we do something, being able to actually think several steps in advance about something and make a choice as to how to respond and control the impulse that we may initially have in favor of thinking something through and making a different choice. So those three kind of segments are what are kind of going to be the uh, purpose of all of the different traffic signs that we talk about today. So I wanna talk about, even just before we get started, about how do you introduce this topic to young children? So again, we want to make sure that kids are aware that this is something we are intentionally working on. Because oftentimes, uh, kids who have executive function challenges are not recognizing what we think should be intuitive. And so we need to bring their attention to it. And that's why self-monitoring of attention is one of the most evidence-based strategies for kids who have impulse control issues, bringing their attention to it. So it's no different to bring it into an example that you can relate to if you are trying to lose weight or eat healthier. One of the very first things that a nutritionist will tell you to do is to journal what your food intake is for a week or so, so that you can get a handle on when you're eating what. What kinds of foods are you uh, eating and when? what times of the day are you most likely to snack? What are the triggers you have? Uh, that self-monitoring of attention just brings awareness because maybe you don't even realize how many times a day you're popping a few M&Ms into your mouth until you journal it. So there's gonna be a self-monitoring of attention component when you're trying to uh, develop a child's executive function skills. The most efficient way to do that is to bring their attention to it. And so I suggest that you really target a particular executive function skill, maybe every week or every two weeks, bring it to the kid's attention, talk about when we need to use it, and then have some kind of a visual cue that helps remind kids when they might may be needing to use it. And then even giving them some kind of a system for monitoring how well they're doing it. And so that's what we're gonna talk about uh, with each of our skills. So making it more concrete for kids and helping them understand here is a skill I need to be able to have, here's when I might use it. And then having a teacher who's giving a visual cue or a reminder periodically. Obviously, there's a, gonna be another really important component to teaching those very difficult skills for kids to develop, even typically developing kids continue to develop uh, and refine their executive function skills all the way into adulthood. In fact, most of us are still working on those skills. So you're gonna to have to have some kind of a reinforcement component, whether it's um, nonverbals that you develop with your students to let them know they're doing a great job. And, and I will talk about how each one of our signs has a visual cue card that you can use to help 
re reinforce that I saw you using your stop sign. Good job. Um, but also you might think about working it into your PBIS system. So if you're already giving out kind of caught being good tickets for other behaviors that you're trying to reinforce in your class, consider extending that reinforcement system to include the executive function skills that you're introducing each week so that you really bring some positive attention to these skills as they're developing. So when we introduce the new sign, we're gonna present that sign to the class. Each sign has a verse that is read out loud to help the kids understand what the sign is to indicate, discuss examples. You might even role play a few situations to demonstrate what it looks like to follow that traffic sign in action. Uh, and then post that visual sign in the classroom in a prominent location so that kids are seeing it all the time and remembering to use that skill. And then I always in, like to encourage teachers to wear a lanyard or something with a visual cue to help them uh, remember, help the students bring their attention to it, and also to remind you to remind the kids and to reinforce those skills. So we know that what is in front of us visually gets our attention and helps us remember to do things. That's why we have, you know, to-do lists. That's why we have inspirational sayings uh, hanging on the walls of our classrooms. That's why some of us get tattoos to remind us of something that's really important. So I would encourage using those visual uh, cue cards and the visual signs in order to kind of help remind the students to use the skills as they're developing them. I also have included in the packet, if you choose to use the actual curriculum, a traffic report, which is um, a way for the students to keep uh, track of which skills they're developing. So after a week or so of practicing the skill as you present it, uh, you're going to have the student return to their traffic report to what to the skill that you're working on that week and you're going to have them mark for themselves. I'm just planning my trip right now. I'm on the road to success or I have arrived. I know how to use that skill and I've got it going on. So that really means that they have transferred and generalized that skill into a lot of settings. I always encourage people because people always ask, well, if this is a self-monitoring system, won't all the kids just mark themselves as having achieved it? And I always like to remind teachers that if you have not approached it in a punitive way, if you've approached it as a positive, to be honest about your own development of skills, your students will be honest. If they perceive though that they're going to be in trouble if they haven't developed the skill, then yeah, they will self-report that they've attained the skill even when they haven't. So you definitely don't want to take any kind of punitive approach with any of this uh, skill development. So you wanna be able to uh, praise them if we do a self check and a student says, well, I'm on the road to success with the stop sign. I still was did something impulsive yesterday and they're honest about that. You need to praise them and, and acknowledge their honesty and their, and their good reflection. So the traffic report has all of the stops or all of the traffic signs that you're gonna introduce in the entire program. And so that is a total of 16 skills that you're going to be introducing over the course of the program. And so again, whether or not you use this curriculum, I want you to think about the skills that are introduced in each part of the program and think about how you would introduce those and reinforce them in your class because I've chosen ones that really have a big impact on instruction and behavior in the classroom. So with that, let's get into each of the signs and what they mean. So we'll connect each of them, each of the signs that we see, we are going to, um, we are going to relate back to those three areas of, of uh, executive function, which are cognitive flexibility, working memory, and impulse control. So the very first one that we're gonna talk about is the stop sign. And that's one I always like to introduce first for two reasons. Number one, kids are already very familiar with what a stop sign is and what it means. And so it's an easy one to teach that analogy of the signs managing your mental traffic. 
the other reason I like to introduce it first is because this is oftentimes the, the skill that is resulting in the most immediate impact in the classroom in terms of academic um, struggles and also especially behavioral struggles. So the stop sign is about impulse control. So it's, it fits into that segment of, of uh, executive function that's about self-management. So the verse that goes with it. So when you introduce the skill of the stop sign, you're gonna introduce this poster and you're gonna read and introduce the verse to the class. So it would you would read aloud. The stop sign means I honor the pact to stop and think before I act. I take the time to think things through before I choose what to say or do. So each of the signs is going to be related to one of those three segments of executive functioning, it, but they're going to be more specific skills, and each one's going to have a verse that really captures for the students a summary of how you use it and when you use it. So a stop, the stop sign is going to mean that we're going to really work this week on stopping and thinking before we speak or act. And so this is a point where you might want to go through some examples with the students. You might ask them to generate some examples. You might even choose to role play a situation or two. And then through the week, you want to be bringing up those teachable moments. So when a student, you know, uh, reaches out and grabs the glue from someone during an activity and that student responds in a negative way, you might be holding up your visual cue card of the stop sign and saying, let's remember to stop and think before we act. So did you stop and think before you grab that glue from someone? Um, when someone maybe calls someone a name or um, says something inappropriate in class, bringing out that stop sign and reminding them. Again, you don't just want to bring it out when the child is doing something wrong. The, some of the most powerful ways that you can use those visual cue cards with the stop sign on is to say, whoa, I see somebody really following their stop sign. They stopped before they said something. They stopped before they did something. They thought something through. So the more you can bring positive attention uh, through the week, the better. So stop sign is that imp impulse control piece. The second sign that I like to introduce is the yield sign. So the yield sign is about taking turns and compromising. And again, it's really getting into that self-management or impulse control segment of executive functioning. Again, reminding us that that is probably the area that has the most immediate bang for your buck in terms of having a positive impact in the classroom. So the yield sign, when you introduce that, you talk about when we might need to follow that yield sign in our brain, <clears throat> which is when we need to take turns. When we yield on the roadway, uh, that yield sign means that we need to slow down and let someone else go first, that we have to wait to take our turn. We have to wait until it's the appropriate time to do something that we might have to compromise a little bit. So the yield sign means that I can learn to wait with patience and take my turn to let others finish what they have to say and to compromise when we work and play. So again, taking that time to read the verse, talk about what it means, give examples, role play a couple situations even, and then have that as this is the sign we're working on this week. We need to recognize the yield sign in our brain that's telling us this is a time when I need to wait my turn, let someone else finish what they're saying, wait until the teacher is done talking to the principal before I go up and ask her something when she's busy at the door. Lots of teachable moments. The more teachable moments you can have, the better. Now, I think this would be a great, this would even be a good uh, school-wide or grade-wide system to use to put up that sign in the hallway so that everybody, all the teachers that are using this are going to use that same language. Let's remember to use our yield sign while we're in the lunch line. We need to wait our turn and let someone else go before us to throw our trash away giving as many examples as you can. And again, bringing positive attention with your visual cue card. When you see students 
following their yield sign in their brain, then you need to bring that up and say, whoa, I really liked how I could see the wheels turning and you wanted to say something, but you waited until your friend was done talking. That's awesome. Or at recess, you know, walking up and showing the yield sign on your lanyard and saying, wow, I really like how the kids that are waiting to play on the swings are using their yield sign to, to wait their turn and be patient. So that would be my suggestion of the second skill to really introduce. So the first one being stopping and thinking before you say or do something, whether you use the stop sign analogy or not, the skill is an important one to teach. The second skill that I would really uh, introduce would be taking turns, waiting patiently, compromising, because that has such an impact on your classroom climate and on academic tasks where kids are going to have to cooperate together. The third sign that I would teach, and again, if you're not using the curriculum, you can still gain from it that this is a skill that I need to teach what in some way if I want to support executive function development, is speed limit adjusting your speed to a given situation. And again, that goes back to uh, a couple different things. It goes to self-management, so impulse control, because do you have kids who just race through something to finish it and be done? Or do you have kids who take forever to begin a task that they've been instructed to do? Absolutely. We've all had kids who have trouble adjusting their speed to a given situation. And so that goes to um, two different aspects of things. That goes to the impulse control, but it also goes to cognitive flexibility. That ability to recognize that I have to take more time with this task than that task. And um, so the, the, the verse that goes with it to explain that we have to adjust our speed of working or responding or starting something to different situations. The verse says, sometimes a task requires speed and to finish quickly is what I need. Others take more time to complete, to be done correctly and to be neat. And so this is one where when I introduce this sign of the speed limit, I'm going to talk about how there will be times when I'm giving you a direction and I say this is one where we need a pretty fast speed limit, guys. We don't have a lot of time before lunch, so we need to clean up the room quickly and put our things away. Our speed limit is pretty high on this one. We need to work quickly. Or when we're lining up for a fire drill, that's a really super speedy event. We have to really um, obey the speed limit and go quickly because that, that task requires speed and quickness. There are other times when we have to adjust our speed down. So when we are uh, you know, writing a paragraph and we want it to be legible, we want it to be neat, we want it to be spelled correctly, we want to have used our punctuation and our capitals, then we might slow down a little bit, okay, so that we really make sure we've done our best work. Those would be two, a couple examples of when you might reference the speed limit. So helping kids remember that just like on the roads, the speed limit signs are different in different areas, in our class, we have different speeds for different tasks. And so that speed will change depending on the task. And you're gonna to look to the teacher to know what speed limit we have for this task. Is this one we wanna go very fast on or is this one one we want to slow down for? Our next sign is expect delays. So this is about waiting and dealing with change. So which aspect of executive function do you think this sign refers to? It refers to impulse control again, um, and it refers to that cognitive flexibility piece, which is the ability to understand that even though we said we were going to go to the assembly at one o'clock, the performers for the assembly aren't here yet. So we're going to have to uh, do some silent reading. Everybody get out your book. 
uh, to read a little while before we line up for assembly. And we know that there are kids who really struggle with that, right? Who, who really kind of start to have a meltdown when the bus is five minutes late or when our assembly doesn't happen or when there's a substitute teacher in the room. So expecting delays or dealing with change is a really important sign to understand. So the verse that goes with that is when I want to cruise fast straight ahead, it's frustrating to have to wait instead. But things can happen on any day that can cause me to expect delays. So again, one of the biggest triggers for some students who, who struggle with executive function is waiting or downtime. That is a really difficult thing for lots of kids. And so that is one of the executive function skills that you need to very intentionally help kids develop. So if this is the sign for this week, then we're gonna really work on recognizing that there are some times when we have to deal with changes or waiting when we weren't expecting it. And so when things arise that the kids have to wait for a few moments, that's when you can pop up that visual support of the expect delays sign and remind the kids, I love how you're waiting patiently. I know we were planning to get out to the bookmobile 10 minutes ago and it's not here yet, but I love how you guys are all following your expect delays sign and recognizing that it'll happen, but we just have to wait a little while. Okay, so the next one is for the skill of maintaining focus and maintaining attention to task. Again, this goes to cognitive flexibility. If you've got kids who really are having trouble uh, shifting their attention from something that has their interest to something else that's less motivating, or kids who uh, really are highly distractible. So it's the, that impulse control that I want to immediately give my attention to whatever is uh, shiny at the moment. So one way is the reminder, the visual reminder that this is an activity that's gonna require all of our attention. Um, so the verse that goes with it is staying focused is sometimes hard when I get distracted or caught off guard. But if I keep my eyes on the road ahead, I can get to the end of this task instead. So this would be the sign that you would be working on to help kids recognize that there are some times when you just have to focus all of your attention in one direction. And so if that's the one that you're having as your skill to introduce that week, again, giving lots of examples and role play and bringing out lots of teachable moments during that week where you're saying, okay, we're gonna be following our one way sign for this task. We have to a limited time to get it done. So we've got a quick speed limit and we've got one way. We're just gonna be focusing all of our attention on our timed math test, if that's what you uh, are having the kids do. And the, all of our attention is gonna be focused on that. We're not, we're gonna put all our other materials away. We're gonna clear our desk of any distractions and have our focus uh, in one direction only. Um, so that brings up uh, another point because if you'll, if you'll notice in that example, I said, we're gonna have a, a high speed limit. We have to be fast today on this task and we're gonna keep our focus attention in one direction. And so you don't want to just let the other signs go into the background as you introduce additional signs. You still want to keep references to that in your discussions with kids, in your examples with kids. As you go about your daily activities, you want to still keep those other skills at the top of their attention as well. Now, once they've kind of mastered them, you may not have to refer to them as often uh, so that whatever the, is the skill of the week, you want to be more intentional about bringing lots of examples to, but you're still going to make reference to the other signs as you go. So that's just something to keep in mind. And again, if you're not choosing to use the traffic jam curriculum, it's still something that's important to recognize as a skill to teach to help kids maintain focus and keep their attention to task. Okay. The next one is for kind of the opposite 
of the one way. So this is divided highway. And this is where we need to recognize that we have to divide our attention for a particular task. So just like we said in some on some roadways when we're driving along, it's one way and we have to go one direction. There are other roadways where there are two directions of traffic going at the same time. And in our own daily functioning, there are times when we have to have divide our attention and have um, two different tasks that we're working on simultaneously. That is a skill that is really hard for some kids. So the verse that goes with that is there are times when I have to use my mind to do more than one thing at a time. I have to split my attention then from one thing to another, then back again. So another, another term that you'll hear used for that is shifting attention. So you can either look at it as dividing attention that I'm, that I'm atten attending to two things at the same time, but you can also look at it as times when you have to shift your attention from one thing to another. So a lot of times, for instance, independent work, when you are have a, a group of students back at the table for reading group, um, you have other kids at their seats working on multiple activities. And so they may have to be dividing or shifting their attention between more than one thing because I'm working on my independent work packet and then the bell rings or the buzzer goes off, the timer goes off and I have to stop what I'm doing and shift and go to reading group for a while. And then I have to do that. And then I have to come back and refocus on my independent work. So those are examples of when you might use that divided highway sign to say, we're gonna be doing centers, guys. We're gonna be doing stations. And so we're gonna have multiple things going on at the same time. We're gonna to have to be able to divide our attention and shift our attention um, and be aware of the traffic around us to be able to engage in this activity. So again, another important skill that I think we oftentimes assume that kids have before they have it. So along with that, this is a perfect time to bring up the situation that we've all had. If you've done differentiated instruction and you have stations going, or you have kids doing independent work while you're teaching a small group, uh, we have all experienced the kiddos who work ahead so quickly that they have not listened for instruction. They've started an activity before they've gotten the directions for it. They've rushed through their work and just so they can be done and they haven't always worked at the pace we expect them to. So the sign for the no passing zone is I sometimes like to finish first and I get so impatient I'm about to burst, but at times I have to keep my pace and move with the group at a steady pace. So this is where you're encouraging the students that maybe finishing first is not the goal. This is not a race. We're not trying to necessarily move ahead of everyone else. We're trying to stay together, everybody work together and get one step done at a time before we move on to the next step. And again, that's about impulse control um, very much. And it's and these other ones were more about the divided highway and the one way were more about that working memory and the um, impulse control and the cognitive flexibility. The next sign is no parking. So we've got the no passing zone for kids who work ahead too quickly. And we've got no parking for the kids who don't move quickly enough uh, and sometimes get distracted and get off task and park for a long time. And so this is really dealing more with procrastination. And so this sign is one that I use for myself a lot uh, that I can't park right now. It's sometimes tempting to take a break and rest from my work for goodness sake. There's a time and a place for rest and fun, but if I park too much, my work won't get done. And so this is about setting a time that it, we're going to work and we're gonna work steady and then we will have a break, whether it's resource or whether it's lunch or whether it's a scheduled break for a student who is um, 
struggling with maintaining focus and, and attention to task. So the no parking is just a visual reminder that we're not going to stop what we're doing. We're not going to procrastinate getting busy. So this is really about latency. So latency is that idea of how long does it take me to get started doing something in the time between when I'm given the direction and when I'm expected to begin work. So um, no parking is about avoiding latency. So it really is about that kind of, um, it's kind of a combination of mental flexibility, impulse control and working memory. It's the ability to generate the intrinsic motivation to get busy with something that I'm not necessarily that interested or motivated to do and to pull together everything I need to get started. And then the impulse control to begin something that I'm not that motivated to do rather than stop, um, rather than doing what I want to do. The next one is no U-turn. So this is, a, I think, a little less frequent, but I have had a handful of students that this is a real issue for, and I'm sure you have as well. This is getting to that student who, and this is a cognitive flexibility issue for lots of kids, I don't want to move on until I've done this one thing right um, or the way that I want it. So if you've ever had kids who erase through the paper um, trying to get their letter H just exactly right, or if you've had a student who doesn't want to move on from a particular aspect of a task, and so they keep turning around and redoing something over and over again. And some of us are that way too, right? So we never get finished because we're trying to um, make this one step perfect. My work is sometimes not quite right. It makes me feel frustrated and uptight. But when I've tried my best a time or two, I need to keep on going until I'm through. So this one may have a little less application to your broad class. But again, it's one I would definitely bring up because for kids that are... Um, a dealing with that, it can be really difficult for them to actually complete tasks. The next one is one I think teachers suffer a lot from a weight limit. So what is the purpose of a weight limit sign when you're driving, when you're on the road? It's to let you know that vehicles over a certain weight are not safe on this particular road. Sometimes we continue adding to our to-dos and we just don't get them done, we are U-turning too often or we are um, not taking action when we need to. Maybe we're working at the wrong speed limit. And over time, we get too many things accumulated on us uh, in terms of work to be done. Our weight limit is exceeded. And so we it's about managing workload. So this is really... Um, of higher level executive function skill. It's about pacing your work so that you get this done before you have another new thing to do. So I would say this is a more common one in later elementary grades as kids have are expected to manage more multiple uh, projects at once or multiple areas of homework at once or multiple step projects. So the verse that goes with this is if I wait to do all my work at once, it could take me days or weeks or months. A bit at a time, I can reduce my load so I can keep on moving down the road. So helping kids. So this one might be a good one to introduce when you do have a multiple step project to do or when you're trying to get the kids to have a set of assignments that are due at the end of the week and they're going to have to start pacing their own work. So helping them to learn intentionally how to manage their workload. For a lot of kids, you're really going to have to actually teach them how to look at a big chunk of work and break it down into smaller components and chip away a little bit at a time in order to manage that weight, weight limit. So the next one has to do with cognitive flexibility. And this is about anticipating a potential problem that arises. And so we have a lot of kids who don't know how to handle it when they get stuck on a problem they can't do, when they uh, 
are starting a report and they can't find the book that they needed in the library, when um, something happens in their family life and it really throws them off course. So helping kids to recognize that life is a bumpy road <laughs> and that there are gonna be times when you have to recognize that there's a bump here and that it's okay, I'm gonna get through this. So this, the verse that goes with it is I'm making good time, relaxed on cruise until I hear have a problem or I hear bad news. If I know a problem is just ahead, I don't need to quit, but just take care instead. So I get a bad grade on a spelling test. That doesn't mean that I am gonna fail spelling altogether. It just means that I need to slow down, ask what I can do to raise my grade, maybe study a little bit harder for the next test, that we all have bumps in the road and that it's okay. The next one is wrong way. So, this is one where I really like the thought of bringing intention and self-monitoring and self-awareness to the child. It's being able to recognize when something you're doing is not working well and being able to change your mind, change your actions, change your words. I think I know a bazillion adults who are still working on this one but it's such an important one in terms of academic success, in terms of social success, in terms of relationships. It's really important to be able to recognize when, it's like Dr. Phil always says, how's that working for you? Um, recognizing when this is not going well and I need to change something about what I'm doing. So the verse says, it happens sometimes when we take a turn, things don't go well and we have to learn when we've made a mistake, we need to reverse we can change directions before things get worse. So again, this is one where you can bring out lots of teachable moments um, with students and you can role play lots of different situations. I do like to remind people that no one, including children, like to be publicly confronted or embarrassed at a time when they are not being successful so try to use the visual cues to point out when the child is doing something really well. So, um, you know, when you notice that a child has um, gotten halfway through the paper, not following the directions, and now their page is all messed up and they've cut out the wrong things, and they bring it to you and say, I need a new one because I didn't follow directions and I think I need to start over that's a time to praise that child and say, whoa, great way to follow the wrong way sign in your mental traffic jam and recognize that you got started wrong and you need to change directions and that it's okay to admit when you were wrong and that you weren't listening and that's okay because you recognized it and you changed directions. Or when you, two students are having a conflict at indoor recess over a game that they, they are playing and they're having a, a conversation and starting to escalate into an argument. And one of the students goes, we can do it your way uh, for a while and see if it works. That's the time to pop over there with that wrong way sign and go, whoa, I really like the way you recognize that you were gonna use your entire recess arguing and that wasn't working well. So you changed directions and handled it a different way. Woohoo, high five. Um, so making sure that we recognize that um, a threat to self image is one of the most frequent triggers for conflict in the classroom between teachers and kids. When a student has to, feels like they're having to save face or they're gonna be embarrassed in front of their peers, that's never a good situation. So try to use those visual cue cards as opportunities to reinforce using the skills well. Now, over time, you might find it helpful as you're seeing two students in a conflict, you might just walk by and flash the wrong way visual uh, card to them as a reminder. Now, I would not go much beyond that in terms of bringing a lot of verbal attention to it. The power of that nonverbal cue is that that student gets the reminder, hmm, there's a traffic sign I'm missing. 
uh, without having to be embarrassed by a verbal confrontation. So just keep that in mind um, as a couple ways you can use the visual cue cards if you choose to use the curriculum. Um, the next one is really getting to that mental flexibility and that's the detour. So again, thinking about when you see the detour sign in traffic. It's when you are going about and you think you're going to take Highway 36 from, like I do, to go visit, we used to take all the time to visit my family in Indiana, that I would take 36 all the way from my home in Greenville at the time to Anderson, Indiana, because the, there was one road that went straight from almost in front of my house to almost in front of my parents' house. But in the summertime when there was road work, oftentimes there would be detour signs and I would have to adjust my travel time and adjust my plans to go a different way. And so the sign for detour is as I go about my day today, I like to do things the very same way. But to learn and grow and spread my wings, I must think and learn and try new things. So the example I always give about the mental flexibility for the detour is, yeah, it was much more convenient for me to just hop on 36 and take it all the way from my house to almost my, the door of my parents' house. But at the same time, it, was, it feels good to know that I know two or three alternate ways to get there because of detours that I followed. And so helping kids recognize that there is more than one way to handle any given situation. And so when you run into a roadblock with one thing that you're trying, you can try it a different way. This has lots of applications, even in problem solving in your academic classes. So I love the detour sign and use that one a lot. The mile marker sign is for being able to help kids remember that they can take a big task and break it into smaller ones. Um, and that's how they can kind of tackle something that seems really difficult and hard to do and that it's going to take a long time and can feel overwhelming. So again, when do we um, use the mile markers in our, in our travels? Well, it's to help us recognize different points along the way, how far we are from our destination, from where we started and to where we're going. And so that can be the same way when we've got a big project to tackle. We can kind of divide it into uh, mile markers to, to monitor how close we're getting to our destination of being done. So the verse for that is an enormous task can feel too large, but I can break it down and stay in charge. Bit by bit, one by one, I can check things off and get it done. So this is where I was like to remind teachers that the more you can model the mental strategies that we're talking about by thinking out loud for kids and helping them see you apply it, the better your kids and the more quickly your kids are gonna integrate those executive function skills into their portfolio of cognitive strategies. So when you are talking about a task that, is, that your class is going to do, let's say uh, at a certain grade level, maybe kids are creating their own book and woo, that's a big, big task. So let's break it down into the components that we're gonna work on in the order we're gonna work on them and we can check them off as we go. Even modeling the use of a checklist uh, and checking things off and having kids take turns maybe on the smart board, checking off the mile markers on that that project of creating their own book so that kids are seeing and hearing you make reference to it and use that strategy yourself. It's very, very powerful. We know that in social emotional learning of any kind, adults play several different roles. Direct instruction is one, but also modeling the skill and responding to students in a way that reinforces um, the students using the skill. And the next one is the exit sign. So this is when you're ending a task and transitioning to something else. So some of us really have a hard time stopping something that we are engaged in and moving to something else. So the verse for that is, hey, look up. 
Up there, straight ahead, it's time to do something else instead. Prepare to exit our current task and be ready to do what the teacher asks. So this is kind of a priming tool to help kids get cognitively ready to switch gears. So you might just hold up that exit sign when it's about time to switch reading groups or when it's about time to clean up the math stations and line up for lunch. Anytime where you have a transition point, you might wanna use that exit sign. The next one is information sign. So again, when you're traveling and you see a sign that says information, that's an indication that that's a place where I could maybe look for additional resources, uh, check out what um, sites there are to see around this area. Uh, so whether there's any pertinent information that I need in my travels. So the verse for that is when I'm stuck and need some help, I don't have to do it all by myself. Helpers and resources can be found if I take a deep breath and look around. So when a child is frustrated and they're tearing up their paper or they're uh, shoving their uh, Chromebook away from them or just doing something that indicates they're getting frustrated, maybe they've just stopped and laid their head down. That's when they would need to recognize in my mental traffic, I need to look for the information sign. Um, this is a time when I'm stuck and I don't know what to do. So I need to remember that there are helpers and resources around me that I could ask uh, for assistance. And again, that's a great one to model yourself for the kids and to point out um, and bring their attention to. Rest area. The, the reality that we do need to recognize when we need to take a break and to ask for that break when we need to. So we have a lot of kids who struggle with social emotional skill of recognizing their own emotions, particularly negative emotions because or what's perceived as negative emotions like frustration, anxiety, sadness, um, anger, because kids oftentimes will will kind of equate those more negative feelings with I'm bad. And so they don't acknowledge them and they don't necessarily recognize them. So teaching kids that it is not only okay, but it's great to recognize the need to look for a rest area and to say there's nothing wrong with a well-timed break. So you don't get tired and make mistakes. Everyone everywhere needs a rest every now and then to do their best. And so I always like to encourage teachers to have a rest area literally in the corner of the classroom where kids can where, be encouraged that if you're getting frustrated, if you're getting upset, if you're tired, if you're overwhelmed, it's okay to look for that rest area sign and ask if it's okay to take a short break. Uh, just like we hope drivers are doing that, right? <laughs> so I'm going to stop sharing there for a moment and just uh, kind of bring this session to conclusion. And again, I hope that you recognize that even if you don't want to use this particular curriculum to teach executive function, that there are a lot of skills that need to be directly instructed, modeled, and reinforced uh, for kids to develop executive function skills, especially if they are already exhibiting deficits in that, it's unlikely that they're going to just learn those kind of by osmosis. We can hope that they do, but if you wanna make your work a lot easier as a teacher in an elementary classroom, some intentional instruction of those executive function skills through this curriculum or whatever ever other method you want to use to teach them, hopefully this, um, presentation gave you an idea of the specific skills that you do need to kind of teach, reinforce, uh, and practice in the classroom to help kids uh, get really adept and competent at managing their own mental traffic, which is what executive function is all about. Hope you got some great ideas. And again, if you're interested in purchasing the curriculum, the digital version of that package is really affordable and it's on Teachers Pay Teachers at the Best Friend Books um, store. And if you're interested in the storybook for kids, it's available on amazon.com. It's also available on Teachers Pay Di Teachers in digital form if you wanna pop it on your smart board. And again, if you're not interested in this particular curriculum, 
teachers are very creative and I'm sure you're going to find great ways to uh, introduce those skills in whatever way you think is going to resonate best with your students. And I hope you have a great summer and a wonderful year.